lot of why things are the way they are is because people don't know or they don't know it in the way that they can understand it. So it might be revealed to them as statistics or just you know data bytes, but it's not emotionally intuitive. It doesn't reach them in a vocabulary that is personally intuitive to them. Welcome to the Stories for Action podcast, where we speak with folks taking bold actions for a thriving planet. Our aim is to bridge divides and provide calls to action to help you find your role for positive impact. I'm your host, Laura Tomov. Today, we're excited to have with us Asher J. Asher is a creative conservationist. She's a National Geographic explorer whose captivating paintings, campaigns, and films drive a single mission to incite global action on behalf of wildlife conservation and biodiversity loss. Asher's travels to the front line have made her witness and storyteller, combating illegal wildlife trafficking, promoting habitat sanctuaries, and illuminating humanitarian emergencies. We hear from Asher about her journey and the lessons she's learned for generating impact. I think it all began for me as a child and most of us come to do, if we're lucky particularly, what we are most passionate about as kids. When I was a child, I really cared about the world at large, particularly the natural world, which I saw continue being eroded around me. I grew up reading a lot with David Attenborough and watching BBC Earth. So I was deeply molded by just the magic and diversity and awe of wild. And to see that being lost uh, for all time to come felt like such a grave uh, betrayal of our role as stewards in this world that I felt truly internally called from a very young age to speak out against it, to be an active proponent towards preservation measures. And so I always volunteered like my summer vacations and you know Christmas holidays towards rehabilitation, restoration programs. And... Um, I just felt like, you know, hands-on impact was the way to go initially. So as much as I could, I would. Then over time, my you know mother told me that I was so emotionally discombobulated and unsettled or perturbed by what I saw that I was more a victim than a proactive agent for change. And so because of conversations I had with her, I wound up pursuing a part that took me away for a brief while from the conservation narrative and being in the sciences or involved in a tangible way with the environment and so I pursued fashion designing branding and marketing which it's interesting because it found its way back into like this new age uh, sort of interdisciplinary career that I have sculpted for myself and I call myself a creative conservationist what I found interesting in combining those two terms was that I was applying my creativity through the sieve of design because design is all about application you know, the marriage between form and function versus art for art's sake, which can be rather in the ethers and just about creating for the sake and pleasure of creating, which is a privilege. And I do understand there's a place for that. And there was definitely a place for that in the past, but now more so than ever, I think all of us should be applying ourselves intentionally, directionally towards addressing and ameliorating many of the realities currently and urgently confronting us because it is to our immediate detriment as seen even with COVID-19 unfolding. So as I grew up, you know, I realized I didn't want to be sort of a business or an individual that would contribute to charities as a tax break. I felt like that was not enough and I needed to come back into the front lines and find a way to apply what I knew how to do in a new way so I leveraged all my creative abilities towards communicating data points, science, and just any kind of um, information that needed to reach and mobilize the masses. Because a lot of why things are the way they are is because people don't know or they don't know it in the way that they can understand it. So it might be revealed to them as statistics or just you know data bytes, but it's not emotionally intuitive. It doesn't uh, create the right level of catalyzation within an individual because it hasn't reached them on on a scale and in a vocabulary that is personally intuitive to them. So for me, I found that that's where I've most derived application for my capabilities because I understood mass psychology, social psychology, and I also loved applying design towards 
helping people come into a moment of epiphany where they were like, aha, that little light bulb went off in my head. And now I know uh, just from a deep understanding, just from a space of internal wisdom, as opposed to just knowledge, which is so transient and can come and go, you know? So I think like when you really hit a point of wisdom within an individual, you mobilize them towards continual action because they fall in love, they care, they feel like it's a part of who they are and it becomes an extension and expression of their personal uh, investment into self and the world. And so that's how my career has evolved into all the different fields of media that I've gotten into because I've just said yes, yes to the means because so long as it gets to the end, which is to help mobilize awareness and enable action in this world, I'm, I'm for whichever conduit gets me there. And you haven't just heard secondhand about the things happening of wildlife trafficking and biodiversity loss. You've also done a great deal of international traveling and seen these things firsthand. Can you speak a little bit to that experience? Yeah. So one of the cool ways in which I've structured my efforts is I think it's very hard to, to authentically communicate a narrative from a truly um, insightful place within you if you haven't actually experienced it, because it's very different to know about something from a distance than to personally be there and experience the, the hate a community can harbor towards a herd of elephants because their crops have been trampled upon and that's their only source of livelihood. Because from a Western perspective where elephants are not in my backyard, nothing I own is getting destroyed and decimated by the species. And I just want to see it alive and well, because I like going on occasional safari and seeing this magnificent animal alive and about. So it's a very um, uh, interesting time to be alive in because there are so many perspectives depending on where you are in that storyline, right? And as conservationists, if we approach it solely from the perspective of this needs to be kept alive for its own intrinsic value, it's all well and good, but if the reality and context does not support it, no matter how many times you try to say that, people are not actually going to be a part of that solution process. So to get them to understand it, you need to go on the front lines and talk to them, understand why it's not working for them, and see if there is a tangible solution you can implement to address a human-wildlife conflict point. And being on the ground has allowed me to have those kinds of conversations, to understand truly whether something can or cannot work. And sometimes the campaign needs to start there. That is the first entry point, is to address the locals before you can even get the international community to be involved in the effort of protecting the elephants on the ground. So yes, I want to appeal to donors and funding externally from brands and from larger foundations so that this nonprofit on the ground can address this point of conflict. But if I don't go there and work with the locals on how they can effectively communicate with one another and address that gap, that hiatus, you're not actually going to get anything tangibly done. So for me, it's about being on the ground, understanding from their perspective before you come in from your own agenda and with a sweeping solution and conclusion and just spoon feed it to people, which will never effectively get internalized or acted upon. Um, and even recently working with a brand, I want like, you know, looking at brand accountability, supply chain transparency, I went to explore whether or not Sambazon, which is um, a company that produces wild harvest acai based products, uh, to go to the Amazon and truly understand that this company has uh, real transparency and is giving back to the communities on the ground, the indigenous people that it works with. And they do, you know, and it's magnificent to see an effective story where a small scale company truly has the commitment and delivers on that commitment by ensuring that they include the local people in the dialogue. And it's not like they go in there to say, hey, you know what, you've done this for us, so we're just going to give you a school. If that's not what they want, there's no point going there and giving them something which is infrastructure that just fails them at the end of the day because it's not even at a pace that they want that development to occur. And so it's like it's so important to go on the ground to have those like really indispensable conversations that allows you to create solutions that can actually be implemented versus this idealism that we can go in with where you can tout solutions that just never actually find real world application. Right. And that's a concept that can be applied to so many different fields and businesses and sectors of collaborating and looking to communities to lead the way on these efforts. And looking at connections, 
as we're having this conversation in mid-April in the middle of international lockdown and quarantine due to COVID-19 and the pandemic, can you speak to how your work around wildlife conservation and habitat loss ties in with the current pandemic and these viruses in general? My work now, I'm looking more at why the pandemic has even happened. Like zoonotic diseases is not something new to us. There are outbreaks that have been more common. It's just not been on this scale ever before. But with Ebola last year, or like just looking at uh, various other infections that have spread from wild animals, whether it's even from wild animals to livestock, swine flu, brucellosis, like anything that you think about that comes from the animals to either human civilization or humanity itself, seems to happen because there's less and less wilderness buffer zones, areas where there's enough space for wild to do its wild thing, while there's an extant level of biodiversity, which means there's a large array of organisms that these viruses and bacteria can occupy without pilfering into hum human civilization. Unfortunately, because as we've taken over more of the world, currently, if you look at global biomass, we are over 97% of global biomass, which means less than like 3% is redwood forests, you know, uh, blue whales, every kind of whale you can imagine. That's 3% of global biomass. So we have pretty much occupied organically as matter most of this planet. We've colonized in such a great scale that if any bacteria or viruses get released into the world, we're the primary host. We, we are the most available resource for these organisms, these microorganisms to occupy. And that's why we're more susceptible, vulnerable to outbreaks going forward. So the more wilderness we call and the more we occupy space, the more likely we're going to be infected. It's just basic math of the science can deduce it just by connecting the dots. So what we need to do more is opting for plans like E.O. Wilson's Half Earth, which is to protect half of the Earth's biodiversity and biological reserves, which means you're building resilience by offering genetic diversity to this overall uh, context. And the biosphere, as the term denotes, should be biologically resilient. And it was constructed through deep time, through evolution, to be that way by offering this complexity of living organisms from the tree of life, from this massive cladogram. And we've just pilfered that into this singular strand that is us. And our lives itself is dependent on this larger context, which we seem to be so removed from. We think we're apart from it instead of a part of it. So that mentality needs to change. And if, if there's any wake up call out of this pandemic, it is that insight that we should leave with, you know, because whether it's climate change, Whatever the reasons that we're pilfering into wild, that needs to stop right here, right now. Unless we want to be having more outbreaks, more disease, more loss, like greater droughts, greater wildfires, more disasters, which results in massive economic hits. Like we cannot afford the economic hits nature is going to throw away if we keep on the current trajectory. So my work has automatically shifted to raise awareness along those lines at present. So I've been creating more campaigns about like coronavirus itself, like why is the zoonotic disease in our vocabulary at present and in our reality? It's because of the fact that we brought this about. You know, this is something that we need to take responsibility for. Um, whether or not it came from a wet market, it's easy to, yes, even I briefly was like, you know what, we should hold the place that physically launched the disease, like if you wanted to talk about China and its consumption habits and its proclivity for TCM or wildlife trade, the wildlife trade, then yes, you want to hold that nation accountable on that front. But really globally, we're responsible for this. All of us are part of this narrative of like sacrificing nature to find greater expression as human beings, you know, and that's just not ever been a, um, a, a thread and framework of existence that is going to work in our benefit. You know, it's not just the argument of protecting nature for nature's sake, but if you also <laughs> want to make the public health and the economic argument, there's plenty, plenty to back that as well. And that's the interesting thing, right? Like people don't realize like ecological collapse is just going to enunciate social and economic collapse. So it's totally tethered together, yet we seem to think 
one can exist at the cost of the other continually, which is why we continue to extend Keystone Pipeline or drill in the Arctic or do any of these things, which all science indicates we should stop doing now more than ever. And yet here we are getting sanctions removed, regulations rolled back so that people can go drill baby drill. And it's just not a viable recourse anymore. Like we have to be acting even if we're being utterly selfish and acting in our own interest, it is in our best interest to save nature. So why on earth are we being so self-destructive and self-sabotaging? It's like we're in the most toxic relationship with our own self right now. And that's really what we need to start unpacking and understanding as to why we want to act against our own well-being. Right. And in creating that change and figuring out that new way forward, there are a lot of bridges that need to be built between different sectors and divides that need to be united. Can you speak to specific examples of doing that in your work, both with the work itself, which intrinsically brings people together and unites ideas, but also from your experience on the ground? It's interesting because the places that are most biologically diverse are also the ones that are more economically compromised. And it's, that's usually because we operate like the developed nations, the post-industrial and industrializing nations occupy those countries in terms of vested interests, in terms of sending our corporations there to source what we need without any kind of understanding of empowering the local dynamic for its own reasons to protect, be self-protecting and self-sustaining. So you have like, you know, Dole and Colgate and all these people holding massive um, acreage in African nations. So at, African people don't have a say in their own backyard about how their land and resources are managed. Um, the number of hoteliers that go into Occupy Wildlife National Park so that they can run safari operations without any regard for whether or not their very footprint of being there is actually eroding into the landscape that they occupy. And again, this is all because the, the, the locals in those areas are economically compromised, looking for opportunities, incentives, ways in which they can develop their backyard, but it's often happen happening at the cost of them and at the cost of the backyard. So for instance, when I went to the Serengeti, I did a two week uh, artisan residency at Four Seasons. One of the things I had to do was work with their staff so that their staff can understand that, you know, they come from like they're Maasai warriors, they're like tribesmen, you know, they've come from absolute rural conditions where they don't have access to the power grid and they don't live in the way that we are used to and what we take for granted in developed nations. And so when they come into Four Seasons and start working there after living in a rural community, what they're seeing is suddenly this like cornucopia of access to resources. Water's just running in every tap, you know, suddenly there are taps in every room and there are switches everywhere that turns lights on, fans on, air conditioners on. They can regulate environmental conditions through like internal temperature settings. So they're just completely overwhelmed by what they consider the sudden abundance. So they think that, hey, this is like free for all. And so they leave water running, they leave the taps on, they leave lights on, they don't understand that those resources are coming from their backyard. And so part of the education was to have the community understand how to create posters and campaign within themselves so that they can better educate that, hey, this is our backyard and we should be teaching four seasons how they should be using our resources. And we need to take claim and hold um, some level of empowerment as well as uh, it's almost like having pride in your own in your own land and in your own self. Right. And that goes back to that importance of community led work and not just speaking to a community or assuming a location's needs, but actually having the people of that community lead and really guide that work. It's amazing how your work touches on so many different topics and in so many different locations around the world. I encourage listeners to check out your work to really see the scope of what you work in. And one of your exhibits and campaigns was titled Message in a Bottle, in which you used some high profile names to expand the reach of the mission. 
Can you speak to the importance of approaching creative partnerships and reaching out to new avenues in order to increase the reach of impact for campaigns? Sure. So I created this uh, work in 2012, and since then it's grown to be 365 bottles, and each bottle represents a different voice in the world. And I wanted to bring together sort of a bait bowl of voices uh, because I believe in the wisdom of the crowds. Yes, you know, when you talk about one person's strong message about the impact of plastics or consumerism on a specific environment or species, it's heard. But when you hear, hear the whole like orchestra of voices speaking for all of the ecosystems that plastic infiltrates and affects adversely, and all of the species that are choking on it or dying from it, and how it even cycles back to public health and, you know, its impacts on us, on our well-being, because even if you're drinking out of a plastic water bottle, it has a lot of additives in the plastics composition itself. You don't know how it degenerates over time. So the number of estrogenic compounds and chemicals, soft additives that it leaches into the water or any beverage that it holds within it is incredible. It's like, it's, a, it's exponential. There's a lot that degrades into that beverage which you don't realize every time you leave it out of the sun or you're carrying it or it moves temperature variations. All of these things results in that particular plastic poisoning the very beverage that's within it. And then you're assimilating it and it goes into your body. And then we wonder where all these cancers come from or where you know all these health disorders or endocrine disruptions happen. And it happens because we're putting it in portable containers for our convenience but it's to our own detriment. So we need to rethink the idea of convenience, the idea of how we want to live in a world that's kind of using through a disposable economy versus can we really think about ways how we streamline what we do and how we do it, the packaging in which we consume it. Um, and if we think all of those entry points through, then we're going to be more aware of the not just our health and well-being, but the health of the planet and well-being. So like, if you think about it, it's like planet, people, and purpose. And those three need to intersect and result in sort of a, a Venn diagram that results in co coexistence. Um, so that's really what we're striving for is what I think. Uh, with Message in a Bottle, the reason why it had impact was because I could use the platform to communicate a voice that was less known, for instance, a small nonprofit and the president or the founder of that nonprofit who genuinely cares about an issue in a small community island nation versus, you know, James Cameron, who has global reach, right? So if you can bring those voices together on the same platform, then one voice amplifies the relevance and significance of another voice. So I think if we're intelligent as artists or designers, we can leverage platforms that we're able to create to integrate people, voices, brands, uh, such that they can bounce off of each other's PR. So it's all about like understanding also publicity and outreach and leveraging communication strategies through the right portals and as well the right individuals or um, identities like brands, personalities, to ensure that the message is advanced cohesively and collectively for maximum impact. Because the average person who walked into that exhibit was captivated because Harrison Ford, Alec Baldwin, and all these names participated in it, right? And their voices were heard in the immersive environment. Because like, as you walk through the bottles, the bottles whisper the messages to you. And so they were intrigued by and captivated by Harrison Ford. But then after that, they heard, you know, the coral reef scientists working in the Maldives or in Palau about, you know, species that they've never thought about. So like, or about Moody Bronx, or things like that are just on a scale that we don't think is important. So I think it's about making sure that the things that need to get heard find that amplification by associating with things that are probably already well heard because it's a platform that has already got mass appeal, but you know, it hasn't been utilized to leverage these lesser known aspects of the world. And do you have any final calls to action for listeners, either around generating impact or your work in general? Yeah, I, I would say for both. So I think in all of what I've done and what I continue to do, what I realized is how you engage yourself, how you show up within you and how you extend that is so critical. Look at how we deal with loss. Look at how we deal with all the different fears and demons within us, the shadow side within us that keeps us from showing up fully in a healthy way for not just ourselves, but for our relationships, for our immediate circle, because that's what you're extending further and further into the world. 
you know? So when you're talking about your impact, it starts in every regard, you know, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and then of course, as a consumer habit. And the consumption itself is an extension of what your internal understanding. So evolve that internal understanding and flip, and flip that narrative, like toss the coin and, and see it from a more positive perspective because in that way, you're not only evolving how you've shown up, but you're going to start thinking about in each moment, am I showing up in the right way? Um, so I think really it's a good time for us to take stock and to show up from a space of wisdom, awareness, growth, uh, transformation, as opposed to, you know, continuing along business as usual, having hidden away from this reality we didn't want to be faced by, you know, and just coming out the other side of this rabbit hole, being more like a rabbit than we ever were before. Like we can't just be kind of hiding from the harsh realities facing us anymore. And the other call to action I would leave people with is, yes, it's absolutely imperative in today's world to change like daily habits. Try to conserve as much energy as possible because we take resources for granted. Like everything is infinite and it's not, it's all finite. We're tapping into resources and we're actually taking from our children's future. So be truly mindful and think about lifespans ahead of you because you've given birth to some, like many people have given birth to the next generation already. And that generation is going to be left with such a sparse future and how selfish are we to like constantly rob from tomorrow today and secondly i would say you know beyond your everyday resource impact and how you consume if you can change your immediate community if you can change your immediate backyard to engage more positively then do that and the other thing i would say is like don't give up on people who don't see eye to eye with you or who don't think it's important yet because you'll be amazed how quickly they change if you have compassion for them and explain it to them in the right language because at the end of the day when we can have a conversation that's what matters it's inclusive and we respect one another and we are having more transparent dialogues about what matters and how can we promote collective existence? Don't ever give up on people just because they disagree with you. Like love them for it because that's where they're at, but they will shift with you if you have an inclusive conversation to sort of judge and condemn them for that because it's all contextual and where, where we're at because of circumstances, because of life, what we've been exposed to and having the right like, sound bite come in at the right time can shift an attitude so quickly. I've seen myself change. I've seen others change. It's highly possible that we'll all change and lead to a better world. So don't lose hope. Don't get all doom and gloom. And don't be like, oh, the end of the world is here. It's not. Like, we're going to do great. Just like focus on the light and focus on the right. Thank you so much to Asher J for joining us. You can follow Asher on Instagram and Twitter at Earth Eris. That's H E I R E S S. Check out all of her artwork and past and present campaigns at asherj.com. Thank you all so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe for more stories and share these episodes with others to hear inspiring action to help you find your role in a thriving planet. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Stories for Action and Twitter at Stories Number 4 Action. Learn about all of our work at storiesforaction.org where our mission is to use the power of storytelling to share human connection and advance a thriving planet for all.